I'd like to thank our um, IT people, sir, you know. Uh, no matter what, we, we always need the IT, right? You know, that, that's, you know, like some people go, well, I'll just go um, every other week or something. <laughs> you know, somebody has to do it every week, right? That's incredible dedication. Thank you, everybody in the booth the studio, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's really a studio. It's a studio, totally. <clears throat> so um, today's going to be a unique service um, because um, uh, we're going to hear a uh, Dharma talk in Spanish and also uh, it translated. Um, uh, also it's kind of special because uh, our, um, uh, Mandla also extends as far as San Pancho, Mexico, and uh, Miguel is here today. And um, I'm going to say some nice things about you. Okay, go for it. <laughs> so, um, you know, now I've known Michael for many years, and uh, he's uh, kept a Dharma Center going there. And, um, uh, through his efforts and uh, friends' efforts like Michelle and other people, but he's kept it going and I haven't even visited yet, you know? So I do make a pledge to visit. So, you know, yeah, we'll see. Right. Right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's quite something. So um, we, uh, we're still working on completely translating um, the San Pancho our book, uh, so it's in uh, Spanish and English, but maybe we'll get there before you leave, right? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so um, it's it's very useful to learn another language. Um, most people uh, that have traveled around the world um, know at least two languages. You know, it's I'm not. Odd, uh, sometimes three. Um, those of us born to privilege in the United States, lots of times we, we didn't have to learn anything. Um, one that is a problem in and of itself, but from a Dharma point of view, um, we tend to get embedded in our own language. Um, so the very fact of language study uh, develops a flexible awareness in mind. Um, so studying, you know, languages that we use today, like Spanish or French or Vietnamese or um, German, or, or, you know, studying Sanskrit or Tibetan, you know, it, it stretches your mind, right? We have, have to see things from different perspectives. Buddha's realization was interdependence, and that meant that he uh, saw the world from a multiple perspectives, not just one perspective. One perspective is basically fascism when it comes right down to it, right? You know, everyone's going the same way. It's a one-way street. So, but um, we we have at least a two-way street, right? <laughs> right and left lanes. And, and America, particularly LA and more in Sacramento, like 10 lanes on each side, right? I haven't driven in LA lately, you know? How many, how many are on the San Diego freeway or Santa Monica freeway? Yeah, so, uh, particularly our tradition that um, the Tibetans inherited from India and then added to, um, tried to keep all the different lanes open. And that's um, my goal here at Lions or Dharma Center. And um, particularly because we live in California, um, it's just uh, crazy not to have um, an all Spanish service or a bilingual service. Um, I myself am a very poor Spanish speaker. Um, I did take Spanish in school, um, not college. Um, I had a crush on my Spanish teacher. <laughs> she was, you know, um, so I don't think I was entirely paying attention <laughs> to the wrong things. Anyway, um, but, uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, improve my Spanish and um, and being able to communicate to um, a wider audience. Um, 
this culture that comes with the language, and it's important to um, uh, immerse ourselves, if possible, in different cultures. And um, I'm happy to introduce Jose, who's here today, and um, he's going to talk about his journey or whatever he wants to talk about. And, um, and I'm hoping we can have some comments and questions and discussion afterwards. And I, uh, let's say a little bit more. It's like um, way long ago, um, I got to know uh, uh, Luis Gomez, who's a well-known um, Spanish scholar. And um, uh, he invited my teacher at the time to uh, go to Puerto Rico and we did a retreat there. And um, it was mostly all in Spanish. And uh, it was kind of great, um, but it wasn't just the language. Um, I actually like island culture and the, um, the sense of community and warmth. Um, I did grow up in a warm family, but it was mostly kind of really pretty waspy, you know? You didn't, guys didn't hug, they shook hands. You see your dad. <laughs> Hi, you know, like that. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I, I want that kind of culture, and I think we have that kind of culture here. It's warm. So um, please uh, uh, give your attention to Jose Esparza, and I'm glad you're here. And you ready? All right. Yeah. <laughs> So you get that, somebody might help you with that microphone. It's a little tricky. Dylan, Dylan can help you with that maybe. So can you hear me? Oh yeah, I can hear me pretty well. Okay. Yeah, it sounds fine. Yeah. Yeah. Bueno. Buenos días. <laughs> ah, muy bien. Una contestación muy buena. En primer lugar, me quiero presentar. Me llamo José Esparza. Um, mi nombre completo es José de Jesús Esparza Solís. Um, Yo nací aquí el 14 de mayo de 1965, um, hijo de padres mexicanos. Um, ambos padres son de Aguascalientes, México, que son, que se ubica en el centro del país. Um, y ellos vinieron aquí, pienso yo, como en el, como en el 63, yo creo. Y... Um, Dos años después yo nací. Entonces yo soy el, el primogénito, este, pero soy hijo, el primero de, de tres hermanos. Um, todos somos bilingües hasta cierto punto. Este, el menor, que se llama Carlos, eh, hay, una, hay una diferencia de 18 años entre él y yo. Entonces es una diferencia muy grande, ¿no? Pero él nunca aprendió el español como nosotros. Mis padres nunca fueron nacionalistas hispanos, o sea, nunca nos obligaron a, a, a hablar español en la casa y luego inglés afuera, sino que ellos, eh, lo que nos parecía bien, entonces eso es, o eso era el idioma que nosotros hablábamos. En, en otros hogares, por ejemplo, este, eran más nacionalistas por falta de otro término mucho más adecuado. Um, la razón por la cual, quién sabe, yo no sé. You know. Pero mi mamá, este, quien se llamaba Melania, este, ella siempre recibió una, educa una educación bilingüe. Empezó en México este, porque atendió una academia lingüística, bilingüe. Sus maestras eran, este, en su general, eran americanas, una inglesa. ¿no? 
y mi padre este, es de, de descendencia argentina. Entonces hay una comunidad en Aguascalientes, y hay varias, ¿no? donde hay argentinos, tanto argentinos como chilenos. Y los argentinos están dispuestos a hablar inglés, porque Inglaterra, por ejemplo, tenía ciertos afanes, o sea, tenía ciertos objetivos económicos en el país, para desarrollar el país. Entonces, ellos siempre estaban expuestos al inglés. Mi papá ya era bilingüe, ¿no? Nada más que él hablaba más este, con cierto don o cierto son británico. ¿no? Este, créemelo, ¿no? Este, a veces cuando hablaba mi papá, en inglés, él, él utilizaba la palabra Fortnite, ¿no? <risa> sí, o sea, para significar dos meses en adelanto, ¿no? Entonces, eso en inglés americano, pues, es muy inusual, ¿no? Pero, entonces, lo que, o sea, lo que quiero decir es que mi ambiente familiar siempre, este, siempre era un, un ambiente bilingüe, ¿no? Cuando venimos aquí, o bueno, cuando ellos vinieron aquí, entonces, este, sí empezó este, la enseñanza en inglés. ¿no? Yo nací aquí, pero, o sea, por favor, imagínense, imagínense lo que es. O sea, yo nací aquí, soy americano, pero mis padres son inmigrantes. Entonces, este, hay dos experiencias que están juntándose ahí, ¿no? Ustedes, por su general, este, como son monolingües, este, no saben lo que es eso, ¿no? Entonces, es una cierta ignorancia, pero es lo que yo digo, es una ignorancia, pero benévola, ¿no? No es maligna. Entonces, este, para nosotros, este, eso es algo que parece ser fácil, pero no es fácil, es difícil, ¿no? Porque hay varios filtros que están entrando, ¿no? Y son, son filtros no simplemente lingüísticos, sino que, sino que también son culturales, ¿no? Hay valores hispanos y hay valores americanos, ¿no? Entonces, cuando alguien, una maestra, por ejemplo, nos habla y requiere una respuesta a una pregunta, entonces, la respuesta no, no es necesariamente fácil. No, unos piensan que sí, pero no es. Entonces, usualmente, lo que nosotros experimentábamos era de que, por ejemplo, si eso es un salón, ¿no? casi todos los angloparlantes estaban enfrente, ¿no? pero atrás estaban los hispanoparlantes. ¿no? Y entonces, la razón por la cual no era porque estábamos forzados a sentarnos atrás, sino que porque nosotros no, no, no nos sentíamos muy a gustos, ¿no? Uh, el fenómeno de autocrítica era muy prevalente, ¿no? era muy fuerte para nosotros. No queríamos hablar, no simplemente afuera de turno, sino que también queríamos decir las cosas en inglés, pero perfectamente, o hasta por lo menos adecuadamente, ¿no? Y eso tomó mucho tiempo, mucho tiempo, ¿no? Y luego para mí, este, ocurrió algo mucho más interesante. Um, como para los 26 años de edad, después de aprender alemán aquí en los Estados Unidos, este, tuve la oportunidad para ir a Alemania a estudiar. Y... Yo decidí ir eh, a una ciudad que se llama Travamunda, en Alemania. Um, y se encuentra en la costa báltica, o sea, hacia el norte, como unas dos horas de la frontera de Dinamarca. Y, y allí este, me encontré este, pues, muchos inmigrantes hispanos, pero en su gran mayoría eran sudamericanos, eran ecuatorianos, colombianos, argentinos, muchos argentinos, y también hasta uruguayos y también brasileños. Y ahí, o sea, muchos de ellos sí no estaban, 
si no, si no dominaban este, el idioma alemán, entonces este, requerían entonces este, un traductor como yo. ¿no? Entonces yo me encontré en una situación en donde yo tenía que este, traducir el alemán al español y el español al alemán. Entonces tengo este don de ser bilingüe o de ser un traductor o intérprete. No, no todos lo tienen, no todos lo tienen, no. Um, yo pienso que a veces, como dice la Machempa, este, que eso es como habilidades este, hábiles, o sea, en inglés, skillful means. No. Entonces, este, todavía más adelante, o sea, ahora, este, eso fue a los 26 años de edad, ahora yo tengo 58 yo acudí a las puertas de la biblioteca local uh, a los 40 años y allí casi de inmediato, este, me, o sea, ya sabían ellos de que yo era bilingüe y pues empezó este, una carrera en donde yo pues este, traducía, tanto traducía, tanto interpretaba cosas polizas o sino política. Uh, americana o si no de la biblioteca hacia del inglés al español no. y eso lo, ya tengo como casi de casi 18 años hablando y produciendo y lo que yo lo que yo quería decir hoy este más que nada es que nuestros principios budistas como por ejemplo el bodhichitta o este la bondad amorosa Loving kindness, um, se puede utilizar, ¿no? No todas nuestras acciones brindan este, de una caridad, este, no, o sea, muchas veces son acciones mecánicas, o si no, tienen una, una naturaleza mecánica. Pero siendo budistas, podemos este, este, utilizar la bondad amorosa como para traducir para proveer información a inmigrantes, y no necesariamente inmigrantes hispanohablantes, sino que también, pues, o sea, de, de, de donde sean, este, rusos, ucranianos, chinos, ¿no? Este, y también, y yo pienso que para nosotros, los, los angloparlantes, ¿no? Mi mensaje es muy sencilla, no es nada complicada. Yo pienso, yo siendo este, este estudiante de, del, del budismo, Ah, me, o sea, hay mucho que aprender, ¿no? Y ustedes este, van a ser mis, mis maestros, ¿no? Tanto Lama como ustedes, ¿no? So that pretty much ends the Spanish, um, the Spanish uh, discourse. But in English, what I wanted to say is, is that, and John, you speak Spanish, don't you? Yeah, so if I forget something, please remind me. <laughs> But um, so my life story actually is kind of interesting, uh, not to like give myself self acclaim or anything like that. But what's happened is that, you know, growing up in a bilingual household, um, my parents were never really nationalistic. They weren't saying like you had to speak English at home or speak Spanish at home. It was like just quite the reverse. Um, some families were like that. Some families were like that. For whatever reason, I really don't know. But my parents were, my parents were a lot more free-flowing. But both of them came from bilingual backgrounds um, already in Mexico. So my mother, whose name is Melania, she, both my parents come from Los Calientes, which is central Mexico. And so um, kind of interesting because my mother, even though she didn't come from a wealthy background, she went to an academy where she was taught English and she was taught English by an American woman. I didn't say this in Spanish, but, but either way, who's that? That's, that's my grandmother. That's my grandmother, Amparo Romo Calvillo. Um, and, uh, that's, was taken in 1943. So, and then what's that? I'm yeah, right. <laughs> oh, okay. And this is my mother. That's 1964, I think. So she was already here in the States. Um, and so what happened was very interesting because my, my mother 
uh, was taught by American teachers and even by an English teacher where she was. So, and she was taught in English, but she, you know, was she necessarily fluent when she came over? Not necessarily, you know. English is a difficult language, it's not easy. Um, and so, uh, and my father comes from an interesting background also because he comes from, he's Mexican, but he has an Argentinian, he comes from an Argentinian expatriate community that had been there for many years. So a lot of them, you know, if you know something about Argentinian history, um, it was like a Spanish, it was never really a colony, but it was more like a backwater sort of settlement. Um, a little, little fun fact for you here. I didn't say this in Spanish, but in Spanish legal jurisprudence, Spain never had colonies in Latin America. So they were known as vice royalties. So Mexico, for example, was the vice royalty of New Spain, Nueva Granada, and, and Argentina was known as the vice royalty of La Plata, known, named after the river. And so at any rate, um, but there the English influence was always very strong. It's the English never sought to really, uh, really make Argentina a colony, but instead they had economic interest. And so tea production and so um, uh, beef production was actually, was actually very, very big. Uh, soccer and rugby, those are all English introductions. Yeah. Um, and so like having tea at, at 11, you know, it was something and actually very important. And so all those became absorbed. So my father brought that with him. So he already spoke English, but he spoke it with a certain British accent, or maybe he spoke it with a certain, uh, I guess, with this uh, British sort of like uh, intonation, perhaps. Or he's, that's why I use the word Fortnite, you know. And so I did, it's not a reference to the game. It's just a reference to the English expression of, of Fortnite, you know. So he wouldn't be using that, and Americans would be like, what? I don't understand what you're saying. So English unites us, but it also separates us. So, so anyway, um, but but my my journey. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily easy. People think it's easy, but it's not. So, all of my cousins, for example, we all have something in common. Um, is that we all grew up in the states and we're Americans, but our parents were immigrants. So there's two different realities going on. <laughs> You know, we're learning one in school and with our friends, and then we're learning something at home from our parents. And so, you know, it, reality here, I mean, it, it may be the same sort of common ground that we have, like, for example, this temple, but what we bring into it is something quite different, something, and how we interpret it. So it goes through many, many filters. And so instead of becoming super confident and sitting at the front of the, of the, of the classroom, we usually tend to sit towards the back because we're so self-conscious, you know, and we didn't want to, like I said, it wasn't just speak, about speaking out of turn. It was about not saying something as perfectly as possible. And so standing out, but for the wrong reasons. And so, you know, we didn't want to become the object of derision for many, for, for our classmates or whatnot. So, and then something even more interesting happened to me later on. It's like I was already, I was like 26 and I was studying German, you know. I'd been studying German for like maybe four or five years. I spoke it okay. But then I decided one summer, it was the summer of 91, and I went to Travemunde in northern Germany. And my girlfriend at the time, she was fluent in German. She went to, she went to Switzerland. And so... But it was an interesting sort of situation because here I was in an area that was a tourist area. It was the summer and I was, I was, uh, I was translating. There were a lot of South American immigrants and also Spaniards. And then there were a lot of Spaniards who had been there for many years. So they were already fluent in German, but then there were also, there were also, um, a lot of like Ecuadorians, Colombians, Argentinians who didn't speak German, many, many Argentinians, and then a some Mexicans here and there, but not really too many. So I had to like translate from Spanish to German, German to Spanish. And the first time I did that, I was kind of like, it's kind of like wiped out, you know, like I didn't, 
I, it was just here I was, I mean, it had nothing to do with English. I was just translating from one, you know, German is a very difficult language, you know, but I did it. I did it. You know, I didn't. So today I'm not as fluent anymore in German, but you know, I, I still read it. I can still understand a lot of it, you know, but I, I don't practice it. So, and where I'm going with all this, and especially with Buddhist teachings is that when I was working for the library and actually I'm still working for the library, excuse me, almost 18 years, um, uh, since the very beginning, um, you know, my, that ability to speak Spanish, that being that bilingualism came out. And so, um, you know, it was on my, it was on my CV and it was on, it was on my application. So of course, right away, um, and the library wasn't doing a whole lot really at the time when it came to, to doing Spanish language. There was a Spanish language collection, all the different libraries, but not really too many and sometimes very antiquated. So as, once again, an opportunity came knocking at my door where someone says, you know, Jose has this ability, he has a literature background. So, you know what, we're going to make him into a Spanish language selector. I'm not a librarian technically. I know it says so uh, on, the, on the flyer, but I, I do library work. Uh, I'm a historian actually. Um, but that's what we do. And so what happened was that I became a Spanish language selector. And so there I began to actually use my own, you know, whatever I knew about literature, what I knew, what, what immigrants needed in order to actually to, to, you know, to train their children, to help them to become bilingual, to facilitate that, to help them teach sounds, you know, um, and so forth, you know, and, and of course it goes the other way around, you know, there's plenty of people who don't speak Spanish, but they check out Spanish books, you know, they teach their children, especially board books or picture books, for example. So it goes both ways. It's a two way street, you know, and, um, Lama Jimpa said something when we on a journey to Arshan talks that I, I, I have to bring up because he says, well, this is California. He says, you know, there should be a Spanish language service. I said something identical about maybe 11 years ago, and it was for the library's, library's Facebook page. And somebody, I put up a, a posting in Spanish, just, just in Spanish. It wasn't bilingual, it was just in Spanish. It was about, probably about a book. And somebody did not like that. So they said, well, what's with all this Spanish stuff and whatever? And my response was, well, this is California. <laughs> so when he said that, I just thought, you know, it's probably a good reason why I'm here, you know, you know, so, so it was, I, and of course I got, I got called on the carpet for it. I got in trouble, you know, uh, just some people, I guess they didn't know really where I was coming from. And so when I faced the manager and said, you know, you know, explain yourself, you know, and I said, well, listen, I said, it's, it's history. You know, it's like, this used to be a part of Mexico, you know, it's not Mexico now. Okay. But it's like, you know, it's just part of our heritage, isn't it? And then she nodded her head and she goes, okay. So I didn't get into any real trouble after that, you know, but you know, you know, opportunities dry up. So, <laughs> so, so, but really what I'm going with all this is that um, immigrants come to, and it doesn't matter where they come from, but language is a big component. And so with that, you know, we can use our, 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 our Buddhist, our Buddhist teachings and all that in order to, I mean, I was, I was linking it to, to Bodhicitta, the way I see it when I attend to somebody in Spanish, I do it with that in mind. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, it can be just simply, like I said before, bondad amorosa, which means loving kindness. And so, you know, which is probably like a tone down from that. But for me, you know, to be like the Buddha is to actually show that kindness to someone to actually bring about, maybe not necessarily to bring out some sort of spiritual sort of message or a feeling, but at least you're helping out somebody. And because it's it's a frightening world. It's a frightening world. It can be, but it can also be a very, you know, a very beautiful world as well. And so I think essentially that's more or less what I wanted to tell you today about, you know. Um, and so I thank you for this moment, uh, for this opportunity, and 
if there's anybody who has any questions, I mean, please ask me. Most of you are bad. Uh, thank you for coming today. Sure. That definitely motivated me to uh, <laughs> practice my Spanish more. Mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting hearing that because I think I picked up maybe every fifth word, <laughs> which Sorry, ended up. I didn't mean to go too fast. <laughs> no, no, no. It was good. It was good because it was interesting get, hearing the entire story and then the entire translation and like comparing kind of what, oh, yeah, yeah. what I came up with. But um, I just actually wanted to involve my daughter in this conversation a little bit. <laughs> if you want to sit up, she. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> maybe not. Because it's, she has a, a friend in school who is from Ukraine, an immigrant. Mm. And I told her uh, when she told me that this girl was coming that um, communication is 80% um, nonverbal mm. and to make friends with her, which she did. And now they're like tight and they're learning each other's language. Right, right. But I just like, how did you, how do you communicate? Like, how did you develop your language together? Cause it's like their own language sure. is interesting. I forgot. But how do you do it? Words and you just oh. Each other and you guys knew what that meant. Um, I don't know. I don't know how it happened, actually. I forgot. You know, that's actually interesting because uh, it doesn't surprise me. Number one, children are very smart and their minds are very malleable. So, I mean, um, I don't think we did that when we were growing up. We didn't make up words, maybe some. But um, like my mother, for example, she had a very unique language. Um, so she, uh, yeah, Spanish is a phenomenon. It does happen, okay? It's not, a, it's the, I, I wouldn't call it a dialect necessarily. Maybe at some point it will be because it doesn't have any rules or anything like that. But, but um, uh, she, um, she would come up with certain words or whatever, you know, and they became intelligible to me, to anybody else, not really, you know, they would hear it and they would say, well, what's this person saying, you know, I have no idea what they're saying. But it doesn't surprise me that, I, that a child does that, because um, their minds, like I said, are so malleable, and so, so interesting. You know, something I didn't say when I was during my talk was that, see, I spent maybe I must have been like maybe five years old and I spent kindergarten in Mexico. And so it's all Spanish, okay. And then my parents decided to come back. And when we came back, I remember it was probably like a cold autumn day and we were at my uncle's house. And then um, my, my older uh, cousin, Jerry, he says, he looks over at me and I think my uncle says, hey, this is, he says in English, he goes, this is your cousin Jose, you know, say hello or something like that. And I remember this and it's like, um, and I'm looking over at Jerry and then Bob is my other cousin. And then, and he, uh, and he, he looks at me and he says, he looks over to Bob and he says, he doesn't, under, he doesn't speak English. But see, what's interesting is that I understood what he said. I just didn't know how to respond to him. So, and it's just an interesting sort of, it's almost like a psychedelic moment because I can tell you, I mean, the, the memory, have you ever seen like those movies where you see like a lens and they put like Vaseline around it to make it seem like it's like a dreamlike, you know? That's what it seemed like to me. So it's almost like it was like, maybe my mind was actually going, making its way into this frame called Jose Esparza, you know? And it's like, yeah, I don't know how else to explain it. I explained it to Lama Jimpa, he didn't have an answer, but it's like, <laughs> But uh, no, no, he did. He said it was. He actually called that core dharma, core dharma. Yeah. But but that was that's basically. Um, I think it was just yeah. It doesn't surprise me that that's what I think. Children overall learn languages much much faster. So the apps like Duolingo is actually they're actually pretty cool. Yeah. 
for adults. Eh, it's kind of like a game. It's like, I don't know. It's yeah. Hard. Did you want to add what the. Oh, that's. Um, Duolingo is also how I learned most of the Russian. Yeah. And I, I think I remember how we made friends now. Oh. So um, I remember that, like, for some reason, I just knew, like, a very important word in Russian, which is привет, which also means, like, oh. hello or hi. I, I forgot which one. I think it means both. But I remember, like, whenever me and my friends see her, we just, like, would say that to her. And then, like, I started asking another Russian friend, which also is very familiar with English and, like, lives in the English area or whatever it's called. Yeah. And then um, we would, me and my friends would always ask him, like, words, like, how are you doing? Just cocktail ah, and we would tell that to her, and like eventually she just, after a bit of playing by herself, she just like started learning some words by just listening to all the kids speaking English, yeah. and then, and then she, we, she we just like for some reason she figured out the word hide and seek or something oh. and then she goes over to us and like ask us to play <laughs> and then like oh. me and my friend are like okay and then we do that and eventually we get tired of it and while we hide we're like doing our own thing and like eventually we, we start going along with it and then like we just started playing different games and she learned more english and then we just kind of became friends and that's all and then yeah. so much so that she translates the english to her from wow. her teacher so they're desk mates and so she'll trans in their language yeah uh, like, anyway yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing it's I, amazing <laughs> it to me it feels like if you're willing this is part of the child's mind if you're willing to just approach it from the communication standpoint instead of the like perfectionism right. standpoint that you can actually yeah. communicate and it may be very rudimentary with pictures and gestures and whatnot but you can get there yeah so yeah. body language plays a yeah. part too so, like that yeah thank you for sure yeah thank this. you that's good <laughs> she's already bilingual <laughs> alan yeah yeah It's just flickers on and off. Thank you for your talk and, mm -hmm. and for being such a stand, you know, for the bilingual quality to our, our, our center. I have a sure. question. I don't even know if you can answer it because your English is so good, but I'm curious about challenges to learning the Dharma mm -hmm. for somebody maybe that has more limited English. So I don't know if you can sort of stand in their shoes. What challenges are there for somebody that comes into some place like Lions Roar mm -hmm. that's you know ninety nine point nine nine percent English sure, sure. to learn the Dharma? Well, like for me, <clears throat> it has. Yeah, you're right. The English doesn't pose a challenge for me anymore. But but um, if you're talking about concepts, is that what you mean, or like you know, like bodhicitta or or skillful means or something like that is that what you're well yeah i mean so even for us it's abstract right because mm -hmm. it, it wasn't developed in english right sure. so we've already got these abstract sometimes oh, not yeah, even yeah. english words yeah. and i i think about the task you've done to try to translate some of our text to spanish right. and i just wonder what challenges people have coming into this doesn't even have to necessarily be spanish could be other yeah native language speakers that don't have this super high command of english right and yet we want to include people sure. and make it accessible so um there is a website called buddhist door um i don't know if you're familiar with it i think they it's mahayana buddhism i believe but they do have a spanish language site it's not very big it's not very big but um that's one resource that i use because sometimes they have podcasts or videos um 
So that is a good place where to help explain or teach certain th or to teach the Dharma, as you said, you know, yes. But then there, there are also many Dharma centers in Mexico, for example, um, in, in Uruguay and Argentina, and a lot of their work is already on YouTube. So the easy way for me to do it is just simply to just go to them, look at a particular, you know, subject or whatnot. Some of them are pretty extensive. Um, and then that's how, that's how I get the terminology. That's one, excuse me. And then also, also trying to find a way to how to convey that. Okay. So, um, I believe the Buddha said something like, I mean, um, I, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but he knew about many different personality types and different ways to actually maybe present the Dharma or something like that to these, you know, to people, if I have that correct. So, so you have to do something similar when it comes to translating this into, for example, in my case, into Spanish. So, for example, the, um, the Green Tara one that I did, um, that, you know, it's not as easy as you might think. It's just I, because, once again, you're looking at certain words that, you know, if you want to call it Buddhist jargon or something like that, or just Buddhist language, and then try to translate that. And sometimes there's more than just one word. It's several words. See? So I have to go back and I have to go try to, and first look for, you know, what's the most common word that's used for this particular phrase. And everything is done in context. You know, I have to look everything out in context, of course it's not, yeah. So it takes a while, it takes a while. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. All right. Anyone else? Um, thank you for your talk. Sure. I understood most of it, but I did get confused around the German part. I wasn't certain actually what you were talking about at that point. Yeah. Like sometimes people learn languages as a way of self defense. Mm -hmm. um, my father's family immigrated here, and I grew up in Iowa, and he grew up in Chicago in a ghetto. Uh -huh. So we would visit family, no one spoke English. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself learning words uh, to limit the amount of food that I was given, or um, I was taken to a Slavic speaking church, oh. and I had no idea what was going on there, except everybody was weeping. So I had to learn, you know, the key words in order to understand when I should weep. And um, so there are, um, and traveling to visit relatives in Slovakia, Mm -hmm. They have a lot of um, prune brandy that they give you. It's very painful to drink. And uh, so you learn how to limit that. And then I'm um, part of my family at previous time, they were communist and non-communist. So you had to learn the words not to use when the communists were in the room and yeah and how to have fun with everybody else. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, that too. Sure. It's uh, interesting, different, uh, just through my dad's eyes and, and through yeah. that family, there's a lot of stuff you have to learn to defend yourself. Yeah. Um, I understand what you're talking about um, because yeah, you can, you can use language defensively or even offensively, right? So um, I have some friends, I have a lot of friends who are Cuban. And uh, it's interesting because um, I guess over the years, this is now, this is what, maybe two, three generations, right? But over the years, uh, Cubans have a, I think Cubans speak Spanish beautifully, you know? But um, there, there are certain, I mean, I don't necessarily think it's a slang, to be honest with you, but for example, they have this interesting way of describing a bus. Okay, so the the Castilian word would be autobus. Okay, but for example, and that many times is used and it's understood throughout Latin America. But um, because it's a it was a 
well, it is a, it's a communist country or a socialist country, I should say. So language plays a great part, right, naturally. And so, you know, there's, in different countries like Argentina, they, they tend to refer to it as, as un colectivo, a collective, you know. Um, and so um, that's one way. But <laughs> Cuba is very interesting. They were referred to a bus and um, using a very, very Cuban word. And they call it, and it's good, it goes like this, la guagua. <laughs> and it's not onomatopoeia, okay? Well, onomatopoeia is like that. What that is, is that many of the slaves that were actually brought into Cuba came from either Angola or that general region or from Cameroon. So it's a Cameroonian, I don't think that, I don't know if there's a Cameroon, I think it's a Yoruba word. And so it's used. And so it's the word, I mean, la wawa. You know, as opposed to, as opposed to saying, I mean, you know, but the reason why is just because it, that's the word that was sort of accepted by the Communist Party as saying it, because it's the word that sort of unites Cubans, sort of like, you know, it's more reflective of the culture and so on. At least that's how it was taught to me. <laughs> but it's an interesting, it's an interesting word, because when we hear it sometimes in Latin America, we, just, we think the people are just joking. And it's like, no, no, it's that's it's it's an actual word it's not spanish it's yoruba you know but that's yeah it just goes to show but yeah i that i guess that can be used sometimes almost defensively i guess you know as a way uh, maybe it's not quite the same the same sort of uh, angle that you're using but that is interesting yeah yes. anyone else <sighs> No? Is there? Is there? Oh, yeah. One more. Sure. So I, I guess I'm curious thinking about <clears throat> the kind of riffing off of your previous question. Since there's so many different usages of different types, <clears throat> you know, different words meaning different things to different Spanish speaking countries, mm -hmm. you know, like you just think about the simple word peanut, right? It's like yeah. cacahuate, mani. you know, mani, yeah, right, right. you know, so many different you know, iterations of the word, I guess I started really thinking about defensively and then back to your question and thinking, to convey Buddhist concepts, are you then taking the context, like you were saying, in which it would be taught in this locale, like, you know, this is mostly, you know, uh, you know, Castilian Spanish, or mm -hmm. this is mostly, you know, Argentinian Spanish yeah. or Peruvian Spanish. Mm -hmm. So are you looking at that context and then going back to like Pali or Tibetan? Or... No, I'm not going that back that, that far, no. But I am looking at it just from the context. I'm taking my cues from like, I mean, sure, if I were like in Peru, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, you'd probably use certain expressions, absolutely, yeah. Um, but I will say, like, for example, I mean, that sort of thing when people talk about, like, is there a huge difference between Castilian and the Spanish spoken? Well, there can be. Right. There can be. But at the same time, if you've gone through enough years of formal education, I mean, it's like here in the States, you know, you get taught English, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or English grammar. Same thing happens in Spanish speaking countries. N now, we become exposed to certain phrases like vosotros or vos or mm -hmm. something like that which is used extensively in Spain, but also in other countries, like uh, actually they use it quite extensively in, in Guatemala, you know. Um, el voceo is used a lot mm -hmm. in both Argentina and in Uruguay, mm -hmm. but also to some extent in Chile. In Nicaragua. Right, right. So I'm familiar with that, you know, but not everybody's instructed in that. So it's just a question, but it doesn't necessarily become something so unintelligible that we just don't understand. Now, that one word that I use about Cuban, that's, that might take a little bit, okay? But, you know, I'm not too worried about it. I mean, if you put two and two together, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, for example, your little girl, you know, using body language or certain context, contextual clues, you're putting it together. And so it's amazing how language works and how ideas form and so on. So you kind of go back to that. So I'm taking it <clears throat> mostly from a contextual perspective. And yeah. Then, wow. Wow. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, sure. Hopefully I didn't confuse anybody, but <laughs> all right. Anyone else? Uh, is, there an, is there another slide? I sent you three, but the other one. 
Right, right. If you don't have it, that's fine. We don't have to go through it. I have my phone up here. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, no. Uh, try. Oh, it was a quote. Pema, Pema. Oh, you found it? And then I'll promise to shut up. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I guess while it comes up, basically, uh, how do you pronounce it? Pema Chodra? Yeah. Okay. So she said something that uh, said that everything that we face in life, everything, um, is basically being on the path. Um, nothing is outside, is outside of it. There it is right there. I can't read it from right here, but I don't know if somebody wants to read it. Everything that occurs is not only usable and workable, but it's actually the path itself. We can use everything that happens to us as a means for waking up. Mm -hmm. We can use everything that occurs, whether it's our conflicting emotions and thoughts or our seemingly outer situations, to show us where we are asleep and how we can wake up completely, utterly, without reservation. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, so um, that's how I end my call. Unless someone else has a, talk, uh, has, has a question or anything like that. Nope. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. I'm hoping we can um, put together uh, this book in Spanish. Um, FPMT actually has translated so much uh, into Spanish, you know. So, um, you know, I I won't lean too hard on um, Jose to do it, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd be interested in what he'd come up with, but uh, I'd like to just make one mention about our inner practice. So, of course, we learn the, the language that uh, comes along with Dharma, whether it's Spanish or Tibetan or Sanskrit or English, but it's essential that uh, we do deep meditation practice to find our own inner language. So, we hear words, but then, um, you know, we're just like uh, Kai was saying, you know, we, we're developing our own inner language about what that means for us. And that's very subtle. So our own associations and visualizations. So even a simple word like bodhicitta, which is Sanskrit, um, it's, it's going to go through a lot of layers in our mind. Mm -hmm. And when people are um, doing deep practice, they, they get in touch with that because um, we have to make it our own uh even you know generally accepted languages are important but um particularly in dharma since uh we prize um personal experience that what what does it actually mean when when we hear a language what because we we each have our own inner language and uh, our own inner story and i enjoy getting to know people's inner language um and hope to learn more um, from uh, when I when I say things in Spanish. I'll notice my inner language might change a little bit. So I'm looking forward to that. Let's do this again, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. We'll we'll end in Paris, but next next time we'll do the Paris in Spanish, okay? <laughs> yeah. So we do a we do a dedication now. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, 
All-powerful Chen Rezik, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Songkapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Lo Song Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Oh, I think we have some. As I'm in the midst of applying for residency right now, wish me luck, Grammarly has again been a lifesaver with my application. Yes, the, um, the community potluck is really a, a, a really important time for us because uh, we get to know you a little better and, and you can know us too. It's a friendship model. So I, I like to say that because I've been told that and I, that's what's brought me back here many a time, friends. And then the other thing is that um, next week, Daniel's gonna give a talk and um, the talk, uh, Daniel, maybe you can help me because I, I wanna get the title right, could you? It's called um, Talking Openly, uh, Transparency and Vulnerability on the Path. All right. Hope you can join us. Oh, my.